Lord, we do want to honor you. We want to be blessed and we want to be a blessing. So help us as we reflect on a year gone by and a year coming up. Give us the spirit to speak to us individually and bless us as a family as we've gathered. And then I pray, Lord, may your name be honored and glorified in our complete being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are at the end of 2023, a little bit hard to imagine. And just a day or two from now, we'll be having to write our numbers different. Uh, It'll have to say 2024. And for some of us, we can remember the stress that was associated with going from 1999 to 2000. A lot has changed. Uh, I do want to say as I get into this sermon, uh, didn't include this in the first, but just on my news feed yesterday, uh, it, it titled, uh, from December 19, it sure looks like phones are making students dumber. And uh, this is worldwide, and I encourage you to look into it. The world's waking up. It would be sad if we woke up after they woke up. Uh, I want to encourage you. Uh, the devices we have may be our greater disadvantage. And then also, as I begin this message, a, uh, another article that appeared this year, it says, the misunderstood reason millions of Americans stop going to church. Now, this would be a good read for all of us, but I, I want to make sure you understand that as the church tried to make itself relevant, it made itself irrelevant. And what's going on right now is that people are looking for meaning and purpose, and they're willing to make commitments. So, the, re- the misunderstood reason millions of Americans stop going to church, it's more about how we're living than it is about anything else. Now, if we could bring those slides up. This morning, I've entitled my message, Anchor Points. And I'm going to talk with you about the beauty, the blessing, uh, the book of Hebrews, Let's look there real quick. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. I want to start my message with this amazing truth. Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm going to begin in verse 17. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, In the same way God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast which enters within the veil." where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I want to say before I start this message, because I'm going to challenge you to think about your lives. The whole focus of the book of Hebrews is to show how the living promises to the living God are so much better than the symbols and the things found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament's an amazing foundation. It is a story of precept and principle, The storyline of salvation is told in symbols in the sanctuary and in stories. But when Jesus appeared, type meant anti-type. Okay? Anti-type means not the type. It's against the type. It's the real. So all the symbols met the reality. What I want you to know is that salvation that appeared in the garden by a promise was told in story and symbol for 4,000 years. But when Jesus showed up on the face of the planet, he was the lamb, he was the priest, and he was the high priest. I could say he is the lamb, he is the priest, and he is the high priest. In other words, Jesus has gone inside the most sacred precincts of heaven to show the angels that what he's doing in us is sufficient And we can be and are in Christ made safe to be brought home. What we're reading here in the book of Hebrews is something better. The whole book of Hebrews is about while all of this storyline has been good, when we come to Jesus, it's more. It's something better. And so I want you to take what is in this verse as I challenge you because I'm going to do two things. 
I'm going to assure you that Jesus is in heaven, ever living to make intercession for you right now. He's, he's come. He's lived. He's died. He went home. He's been taking our prayers and been presenting them to the Father with the beauty of his perfect life and the completeness and the beauty of his sacrifice. But he can't lie. He's made an oath. He came here to live it out before the foundation of the world. And now he's in heaven as our high priest interceding for us. How could it not work unless we make it not work? And so this morning as we start, I'm going to challenge you to look at your lives, but I don't want you to overly look at your lives. I want you to stop and think about how things are. Let the Spirit speak. Before I came out here this morning to talk to you, I'm praying, Lord, speak. At the end of the day, this is just a gathering of God's family. The sermon's for everybody and nobody. It's kind of funny what happens during sermons. You know, I had somebody at the end of first service say I was looking right at them. I didn't even know they were in the audience. All right? So I just want you to understand how sermons work. It's the Holy Spirit. This is a divine worship power. Let God talk. And if he talks to you, go away glad. But before he talks to you about what may need to change, I want to talk to you about what he's done that's unchangeable. He's paid the price for the whole human race. Your name is written in the palm of his hands. Your name's written down in the book of life if you've given him your life. And as much as you may stumble and as much as you may look at yourself and say, Lord, how are you going to do this? Jesus says, it's doable. <laughs> I spoke the worlds into existence and I'm, I'm, I'm remaking you. Justification is the work of a moment. He declares us safe to save. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. He prepares us to live our new saved experience. You stumble on the way, just keep your hand in the hand of God because steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down because the Lord upholds him with his own hand. That's where we're at. Now, having said all of that, I want to make you secure in Christ. As long as you're surrendered, I can't give you something God didn't give you. But if you came here today and you'd like to be secure in Christ, I'm inviting you, rededicate your life to him. Give him permission to talk. Let him do something beautiful. And now let's talk about what he might need to do. On the screen, I have a picture of what they called the silver bridge. This bridge was painted with aluminum paint. It opened in 1928, and it was a connecting point between Pleasant, West Virginia, and Canaga, Ohio. The bridge collapsed on the evening of December 15, 1967, killing 46 people. Nine people on the bridge survived. Now, as you look at the bridge, it's a unique construction. What you can't see is that these are all chains that are holding the superstructure up. This is, this is the roadbed, and these are chains. It's not a wire suspension bridge. What you need to know is that that bridge got a 2.54 millimeter. Um, it wasn't even a crack at first. It was just an indention. It was a groove. But the weather and the cold and everything worked on it. One chain in this bridge broke. And when it broke, both of those towers collapsed. They could figure out where the chain broke by how the towers collapsed. And the sad thing was, was that it, it took so many lives. It was a rush hour period of the evening on December 15. And all kinds of carnage was the result of this breaking. Here they are hauling a car up out of the bottom of the Ohio River. This was a big bridge. Now, the silver lining about this experience is that from that point forward, in 1967 onward, all bridges would be inspected at least once every two years. You don't hardly ever hear about a bridge collapsing anymore. We did have one collapse over the Mississippi River probably 10, 15 years ago. Bridges don't collapse like this anymore because they are inspected. All right? Some states have one-year inspection rules. What I want to tell you is, is that spiritual people and spiritual lives are not to implode and come down, but they do need to be inspected. And this morning, I'd like for you to do just a little bit of inspecting. I believe God wants you to do it. We're getting ready to end something and start something. Jesus is coming back, and he is speaking to us. Now, I want to bring to your attention probably the most famous ship other than the Titanic. When you think of the oceans, you think of the Titanic. When you think of the Great Lakes, you think of the Edmund Fitzgerald. 
This was a very efficient uh, iron ore hauler, taconite, they call it. And uh, you know the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald on November 10, 1975. It left uh, Superior, Wisconsin, or Duluth, Minnesota, I don't remember which one, and headed across the Great Lakes, this case, Superior. And uh, Superior is a lake that can be very difficult in the fall. This was November. It was traveling with another ship, and the winds began to come strong out of the north. They tried to hug, uh, relatively speaking, the north coast of Superior, which is mainly uh, Canada, but uh, the one ship was faster than the other, and it started to get away. Eventually, this ship lost its radar, and there are a variety of suggestions about why this ship sunk. Now, Lake Superior is very deep, but when you get over to the eastern end, there is a mountain underneath uh, the lake, and it creates a couple shoals. Um, there is the suggestion that they might have hit a shoal. What we do know is that uh, 29 men died on this boat. Now, I want to give you the aerial view because this was an iron ore freighter, and all of those are decks where you can load things into the boat. Uh, the issue with those decks, there you can see them up close, is that they have to be battened down. There are fasteners. And this morning, I'm talking to you about anchor points. I want to talk to you about fasteners. They're not all illustrated by anchors. And this is what a properly fastened down uh, deck hold should look like. There is some question that this was not the case with the, uh, the deck holds on this boat and that eventually it took on water and foundered. Now, what most people don't know about the Edmund Fitzgerald is that the year before it went down, it lost its anchor as it was in an anchorage off of Detroit. You can watch this online. Here's a picture of one of the divers going down. 35 feet of water in the Detroit River. Very murky. But with the help of some high-tech equipment, they found the anchor and they pulled it out. Unfortunately, uh, the anchor was kind of a harbinger or a forerunner of the fate of the boat. Uh, but when they pulled that out in 1992, 12,600 pounds of it, uh, nobody has suggested that the anchor was the issue with the boat, but the anchor itself is an important part of any boat to keep it from being... Tell you what, let's turn this mic off that I'm using and we'll go just... Yeah, this microphone here. It seems like we're having problems. Now, I want to show you one more boat before I take you. This is the Wenatchee. It is a 400 plus foot uh, passenger and car ferry that operates in Puget Sound. And uh, it caught on fire. It did $3.8 million worth of damage. Very large boat. I'm going to show you why it caught on fire. Now the engines, uh, a lot of these boats are driven by electric motors, but there's diesel engines that generate the electricity. When the engines on this boat were overhauled, uh, somebody who was a smoker had discarded their lighter into the, uh, I don't know if it was the big oil pan or one of these diesel engines or what. But when they were doing some inspecting, they'd start one of these engines up. They were doing some inspecting. They found some debris. They got what they thought was about 70% of somebody's lighter out of the engine oil of one of the engines on this boat. Now, you can see there's a couple engine rooms and a couple motor rooms. For those of you that aren't very mechanical, you need to know the difference between an engine and a motor. An engine generates its own power and runs uh, like an internal combustion motor off a substance that's within it. A, a motor, on the other hand, is like an electric motor. It's running off an outward source of energy. So there are two... Uh, combustion diesel motors in here, thank you, and there are two uh, electric motors. Well, the yellow phase, or the yellow spot, is where you can see the motor I'm talking with you about. Now, what happened? That motor not only had debris from somebody's cigarette lighter in it, but it appears that one of the mechanics made a colossal mistake. And the mistake was is that when they were connecting the piston and the connecting rod to the crankshaft of the diesel motor, they didn't follow the proper calibrations. These things, you have what's called a torque wrench. And you tighten the nuts and bolts on these things to a certain foot-pound uh, element so that they're, they're properly, uh, they're strong enough to stay together. Now, what you're looking at here is a piston and a, crank and a connecting rod laying on the floor 
of the engine room. You can see it in the bottom corner here. That's supposed to be up inside this uh, sleeve, up inside this cylinder. Not only did it throw the piston out, but it belched out all kinds of combustible gases which caught on fire. Now, fortunately, this uh, boat was out for a test run, and all it had was 17 uh, uh, ship's crew on board. But it did $3.8 million worth of damage, and you can see the bolts that came undone. So I'm talking this morning about connections. And I want to talk to you about how well you're connected to God, His church, and its mission. When it's all said and done, the boat had to be dry docked and all kinds of extensive uh, time, energy, and money put in to the experience of rehabilitating it. Now, this morning, I want you to go with me to 1 John chapter 5. I'm talking with you about connections. I'm talking with you about anchor points. 1 John chapter 5, the little bitty epistle in the back of the New Testament, the longest of his three there's five chapters in this epistle, and John is very loving and beautiful and very direct. Uh, he'll tell us if we don't obey the commandments that we're liars. He'll tell us also that we're loved. I mean, John is consummate uh, pastor, longest lived of the 12 apostles. But we get down to the end of his book, and he has this very interesting final statement that he makes, which is how I want to launch into the biblical and spiritual part of this message. He comes down to the end of his uh, five chapters, and he has these six words. And this is what he says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. He says, little children, guard yourself from idols. Now, I want you to think for a moment about that 2.54 millimeter uh, wear point on that chain that caused the silver bridge to fall in. I want you to think about the corrosion. Do you ever, do you ever have a, a, a battery that's in a, a flashlight that's been in there too long and you pop the lid off it? What happens to those batteries? They corrode. How about you go to charge, uh, start your car and it won't start. You go out there and you lift the hood and you look at that 12-volt battery and you'll see near one of the posts all this green uh, fuzzy stuff. Corrosion on the connections that we have to Christ are, it's deadly. Now, I've rarely ran into somebody who's willing to say, I've got an idol in my life, I'm working on it. No, people don't do that. There's a denial to the devotion that is given to something that's warring against your spiritual experience. But I want to say to you this morning, Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ tells us how we can determine where our heart really is. She says, it's what you love to think about, and it's what you love to talk about. Now, I don't want anybody building their life on emotion, but I want to tell you, without emotion, there is no devotion. Devotion is an emotional word. Now, you can have discipline, and that's good. As a matter of fact, I want to talk with you about discipline today because it's your choices that lead to your feelings. But once your feelings take over, they can keep you in the wrong arena of choices. But I want everybody to know here today, there are people that can stand up and yell at a NASCAR event or a football or basketball event, be it high school or professional, whatever it may be, but they can't sing the closing hymn to the church service. They'll be caught dead saying amen to anything, but they have no problem talking about their favorite hobby, which might just happen to be more than a hobby. But without emotion, there is no devotion. Jesus understood this. This is why when he writes to the first of the seven churches, the church of Ephesus, he says, you know, you're doing all this right, but this is what I really have against you. You've got discipline without devotion. You've lost your first love. And for some of us, we've never discovered it. And there's a reason why. It's just like a man who forms an alien bond with the wrong woman. The love for the first woman goes away. You can't love two things supremely at the same time. That's why we have laws that govern our relating once we're married. Boundaries. And in the Christian church and in the walk with Jesus, it's the same way. You have no boundaries. You'll have corrosion on the anchor points, and eventually you won't love like you want to or like you used to. So this morning, I think it's super important that John's last six little words is, little children, guard yourself from idols. Now, let's just do a quick rundown of how the devil gets his, his idolatrous affection going in our hearts. Well, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Some of you are wasting your time on, on uh, YouTube. 
You're, you're making sure that all these YouTubers are making a lot of money because you're one out of however many hundreds of thousands or millions. Now, mind you, YouTube can be used for good. We're streaming on it right now, and we're thankful for it. But I want to tell you something. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. I, I want to talk to you about these devices. Well, maybe I don't have mine with me. But the truth of the matter is, in a group this big, somebody's having problems with looking at the wrong things. And it could be men and it could be women. But I'm here to tell you, it might be the year in which you say, all I need my phone to do is allow me to make a phone call or send a text. They do make phones like that, by the way. And some of you need to say to your spouses, I need one. And you need to get rid of the one you've got. Because I want to tell you, nothing is more corrosive to love than feeding the appetite of the eyes the wrong way with what is the open sewage flowing in the unseen airwaves that are going through our, our church right now. So I'm appealing to you. If you have a problem with something that's coming through the eye gate this morning, I'm appealing to you to make a decision here and now before you're sitting in front of it again. And what the Bible says to do is flee sexual immorality. So if you have the problem, you're not going to call It's a natural appetite that's been hijacked. Let's go to the mouth gate for just a minute here. All right? Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve was beguiled by pride and flattery, but she did sin by eating. Jesus came and he walked on this planet for not too many uh, years in his ministry before he was confronted with finding victory where humanity had found defeat. He went 40 days without eating. He was offered the opportunity to exercise a little divinity here. Go ahead and prove to me who you are. Turn that rock into a loaf of bread. You need it. You got to finish your ministry, don't you? Jesus said, I'm not doing it. I want to tell you folks, for some of us right now, today and tomorrow need to be the last day that we're doing certain things. I was on the phone the other day with a friend, yesterday actually, very vigorous man. His father lived to be 96 years old. This man is stronger in his, at, at 70 than I probably was at 30. He's an exceptionally hardworking person, but he said to me on the phone the other day, he said, I went and got my blood work done. He said, my cholesterol was twice as high as it's supposed to be. He said, I'm giving up meat. Now, mind you, he's 70 years old. It's not going to be easy. And mind you, when Ellen White gave it up, it wasn't easy either. There were times she looked at the plate of food in front of her, and she said, I'd rather not eat if that's all I get. I'm here to tell you, Daniel is a type. He's a symbol of those who will see Jesus come. The book is for those who live at the time of the end. He was a vegetarian. And by the way, it's a good time for all of us to say to ourselves for multiple reasons because we want clear thinking and spiritual discernment that I need to climb a little higher on the journey of sanctification. And part of how I'm going to do it is I'm going to face down my appetite, which I take care of two or three times a day. And I'm going to start by saying no to certain things. And by the way, say no to certain things is how I'm going to end this message. Your greatest freedom may come in the things you leave behind. But I'm here to tell you today, as I get ready to turn 60 in this new year, I'm awfully thankful that as a teenager sitting in a Seventh-day Adventist classroom with a teacher who had a master's degree in parasitology and biology and who was a vegetarian, that I found the Spirit of God confirming my choice 40-some years ago. Go ahead and let go of the flesh food. Let the living things live that breathe anyway. And you go ahead and enjoy the things that I put out there for you to enjoy that make you last as long as you can last. And you know, I pray regularly, Lord, make me like Caleb and Joshua. Not as young as I used to be. But remember, Caleb said to Joshua, I want to take that mountainous area where the giants are still living. And of course, he was now 40 years older than he had been when they tried the first time. If I'm going to pray like that, I better live like that. And part of what I need to do is say no to what goes in through this opening. Now, in my house, my wife has perfect access to look at all of my stuff. I don't ever erase my history, and none of you men should either. Nor should you women, nor should you kids. Your history should always be available, and you need accountability. Otherwise, something corrosive is going to go on in your life. Your anchor points are going to be compromised. But I'm here to tell you today, the decisions that you make where you say no are often in a sinful world the decisions that give you a greater joy and a greater confidence as you look forward to that moment when you see the face of Jesus. Let's talk about our ears for just a minute here. This world is addicted to its music. 
And there are too many Christians listening to music that is thinly veiled worldly music that has Christian so-called words to it, and it's taken them down. And some are listening to rock and roll music and jazz and whatever else it is out there. All right? Your music bypasses the way you think and connects you to the things you don't want to be connected to if it comes from the wrong place. And I'm here to call as many as need to this morning to maybe take a 10-day or so John the Baptist type fast and say, I'm letting go of this for now. And I'm going to see after 10 days of thinking and praying and studying about it whether or not I want to embrace it again. Now, I know how music works because I used to listen to all the wrong music too. But I can tell you when I became a Christian, I said no to that. I can also tell you that in my late teenager years, I started listening again. And you know, it was almost like there was a direct relationship. My spirituality went down as my listening to the world's music went up. It got so bad that at one point in time, the only reason I didn't go to church was because I didn't want my mother probing in, my backslidden mother, probing into my spiritual life. I didn't want to tell her I was a walking sarcophagus. I was a whitewashed tomb. So I kept going to church, fortunately, where at least the message was being given and the fountain was flowing, and I made some different decisions, praise God. But I'm here to tell you today, my listening repertoire is based on principle. I'm not legalistic, at least not to my knowledge, but I do want to live free. I don't want to live encumbered by the things that are going to rob me of my eternal life. And so what I listen to is quite limited, and I'm careful. I do believe in new songs. The Bible says sing a new song. But I'm here to tell you there's principles that guard music. And if you don't know the principles, hang on. Get online. Come see me. I'll give you a recommendation for a good book or two. But I will tell you this. The spirit of the world and the spirit of heaven are very different. And you don't need a whole lot of education to be able to say, hmm, that's kind of making me feel like I used to feel, or that's got too much of this in it. So I'm appealing to you. All right, touch. I want to talk to you about touch, the dynamic of what we engage in. We should have lines of propriety around who we are. The appropriate people in our life should receive the hugs, the spouses in our lives, the kisses, all right? But the dynamic of proper boundaries is important. And then let's go to the olfactory senses. Let's go to the nose. I walked into a large store the other day, and it seemed like everywhere I went, I smelled marijuana. I'm here to tell you, friends, this is a plague And the longer it goes, we're going to find out the worse it is, even as states fall over themselves to make sure that they can do it. And if you're on medical marijuana, please don't send me a note about how much you need it. If you need it, that's fine. But I'm here to tell you, most of us don't. And it stunts the development emotionally and relationally of people. And we don't need that. I'm here to tell you our cell phones, which are an assault on all different sides of our gates that keep our character These things ought to be duly considered to make sure they're working for us. And if you have any doubt, show what you doubt to somebody else. And they'll be able to tell you, at least if they're somebody that can be straight and true. Keep yourselves from idols. Now, having said that, I want to talk about a few spiritual disciplines. Yes, I said disciplines. Disciplines that should become devotion. I want to talk to you, first of all, about prayer. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth what? Much. I want to tell you, we're coming up against circumstances in the future where the only thing that's going to fix them is God. And I want God to listen to me. But along with prayer is His Word where I get to hear Him. But I'm here to tell you, most people hear God talking to them long before they want to admit it's God. I had somebody between the services walk up to me in the the narthex and say to me, they talked about my sermon, and they said, God was already talking to me, but he talked to me again through you. I said, yeah, that's amplification. That's how it works. That's why you come to church, by the way. You don't like that nagging voice of the Holy Spirit? You don't like kicking against the pricks? Show up at church and see if God wants to do something that's totally disconnected and completely connected. In other words, the preacher doesn't know anything about what's going on in your head. The Holy Spirit does, and the Holy Spirit uses the preacher to say, yep, that was me talking to you. This is how it works. 
By the way, someday the first people to be thrown in jail are going to be the preachers. And then you're just going to have that direct link with Jesus, which you have already, but sometimes you substitute human beings. Not parents, not preachers, not teachers. I don't want to get between you and God. And this morning, I'm doing my very best to make sure we can have a vital church. Because I'm going to tell you, if all of us in the morning, Psalm 5 says, Lord, in the morning thou shalt hear my voice ascending to you. In the morning, go to bed at night. Set your schedule. In the morning, before you go out to meet everybody that God wants to work through you to witness to, in the morning, you should have time to talk to God. Not in a hurry. Go to bed earlier. Most of us aren't working 12, 14 hours a day. Go to bed earlier. Get up earlier. Find a place in your house where nobody can overhear you. Kneel down and start talking to God. And go slow enough and think about in specifics what it is you want God to do. He said you could ask. The divine creator of the universe gave you permission to ask him for anything. He did direct you to pray in his will. So after you're done asking, say, not my will, but your will be done. Friends, I'm convinced now more than ever that the only way anything gets done on planet earth is through God, especially in the spiritual realms. God gives us a chance to participate. God gives us the chance to be in the game. We're the cooperator, but we're not the initiator, unless it's our prayers that are initiating. Some of you are walking through life, and you're wearing a placard that says, I'm a Christian. But like Alexander the Great, who found that soldier who in cowardice and disheveledness and lack of discipline somehow managed to be in the precincts of the great leader, he said, either change your name or change your ways. Some of us are breaking the third commandment that says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, because we say we're Christians, but we only really connect with God once out of every seven days. It doesn't work. The most vital thing that works is the Holy Spirit in somebody's life. It's simple. There are routines and fundamentals that will make this thing work. Your preacher can't make it work, although it ought to be working in him so that it has the chance to stir up something in you. But I'm convinced more than anything else that if even half of us, but imagine what could happen if most of us were actually in an appointment with Jesus day by day that says, Lord, today I'm yours. Lord, take my heart. I cannot give it. It's your property. Keep it pure for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self. Mold me and fashion me and raise me up into the heavenly places where the rich current of your love could flow through my soul, the heavenly atmospheres. Look, friends, somebody who walks into this church should be able to sense in a few short seconds that something very unique and otherworldly is going on here, if it is. And if it's not, woe be unto us as we multiply programs and sermons, and postings on social media. It's got to work individually in our lives so that it can work collectively. And woe be unto us at the end of the age if our light should be like a city set on a hill and we should be burning bright, but instead it's, a, it's just basically a smoldering flax. Let the wind of the Spirit breathe into your life and let the flame come alive. Whatever the change may be, I can assure you being used by God and being at peace with God and having order from God will be better than the temporary fixes you get. Yes, the effectual fervent prayer. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This was written to Timothy. It was Paul's admonition. And it's for us. And without it, we'll find ourselves dull. And being dull in an age where people are diligent in the ways of the world is a mistake. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This version says, be diligent. Some of your versions say, study. Be diligent to present yourself approved by God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Sounds like... Uh, Sounds like he and John got together. The truth is, is that this book has the power to not only transform us and tune our ear to hear messaging from heaven, it has the ability to set other people free. If the spirit that guided the writing of this book is operating in our lives, we'll have many more providential encounters. 
Take your Bibles and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. Go towards the back of your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to look at verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. In 1 Peter 4, verse 8, I hear you turning your pages. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. It says, above all, I always like it when they use these phrases, diligent. You know what it means to be diligent? It means pay attention. It means focus. It means keep looking. If they have been diligent to expect, inspect the chains on the silver bridge, 46 people might not have died. Be diligent. I always like it when my doctors are diligent. They're paying attention to the latest medicine and they're remembering the facts from my last visit. I always like it when the people that are operating on my church members are, are diligent. They, they're careful with the scalpel. The anesthesiologists are, are wise in how much uh, medicine they give to take a sense of consciousness away. Above all, verse 8, 1 Peter 4, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Go on to verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now listen, there's no way you can do what he says to do, which is divine, Holy Spirit-breathed instruction. If the church is the witness that shows the unfallen worlds the power of God, if the church and its unity and sweetness is to be the witness that says there's another government that operates on this planet, it's operating in individual members of this church, and it's operating in our, our, our collegial and our cooperative efforts, in our corporate efforts with each other, what happens to a church where they don't do this? What happens to a church where there's a root of bitterness growing between people? They don't like each other. Oh, they believe the same things, they say. They all know Saturday's the Sabbath. But when they show up at church, they don't really want to get too close to each other. Now, that's way off on the far end of the wrong spectrum. But let's talk for a moment in the positive. Imagine a church where the people actually spend enough time. They have enough shared common experience. They know enough about each other. They've learned a little bit about temperament and history, about likes and dislikes, to where they actually have an emotional bond with each other. Now, I'm not for inappropriate bonding, so let's be wise about this, okay? But I'll tell you what, the apathy and the lack of connectedness in God's church is what's making it easy for people to be offended. It's what's easy for keeping people away. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. I want to tell you something. Just like these climbers that are climbing mountains, they're all roped together. If one loses their grip, the theory is, is that somebody on the rope farther up is going to keep them from going down the mountainside. I watched a video of a mountain climber, and they were climbing up a, a vertical, uh, it, it really was a waterfall almost, not very much water on it. He had his two ice axes out, he had his crampons on, he was coming up the face of a cliff, and there was a little bit of water flowing out of this. Now, this was videoed by two people up above him. And as they're watching him come up the top of this, uh, he's, he's working his way to the crest of this little waterfall. He, I don't know if there's other climbers behind him or not, but there's no visible rope on this man. And by the way, for all of you out there think you've got to do it your way, well, you're climbing free solo. And I want to tell you, that's dangerous. When you fall as a free solo, it's over. It's curtains. Just read about somebody, a 26-year-old woman last night, fell 500 feet to her death in Colorado. I think it might have been, it's in the last few years. These free soloers that become famous for, for scaling, you know, El Capitan or whatever it is, is very dangerous. It's not the wise way to enjoy the this, this sport of rock climbing. But this guy's coming up the face of this stream. And the two people up above him, a man and a woman, the woman says, would you like to clip into our rope? He says, yes, he's fatigued. So he takes his ice axes, he sticks them in, in their, their holding loop, and she throws the rope down to him. And he has a hard time even finding a way to clip the carabiner into his harness. I don't think he took more than two hacks at the ice when the whole ice ledge underneath him gave way. And he would have gone to the bottom. 
We need each other. And the only way we're going to get close to each other is by saying, you know what? The church matters. And the church isn't just, it's, it's not even primarily tongue and groove lumber and block walls and carpeting. No, the church is the living stones being fitted together tightly is what Peter will say. You need to not only be at church, you need to be at Sabbath school. You need to be at the prayer meeting or the small group, whatever it is. You need to be at the evangelistic meeting. You ought to be at the Vespers. These churches, I know of no church that's open too much for most of the members to be there most of the time. And this is to our, this is to our chagrin. I'm here to tell you, when somebody tells me they walked into this church, I had somebody come in and see me this week. They told me about a relative of theirs. The relative had not been going to church for a long time. They went into a church, and in that church, they found genuine, other-centered, intentional love. And I'm here to tell you, most people are looking to see if they belong They're looking to see if we're their kind of people. Well, I want to tell you something. Jesus is everybody's kind of person if you have any interest in the truth at all. And when Jesus' people look like Jesus, it's not hard for the rest of the people to say, I'll try this out. Friends, the Bible says, let's go to it, Hebrews chapter 10, goes right along with this. You know it's one of my favorite texts. I hope it becomes one of yours. But I'm not quitting, and I'm not giving up on this. Hebrews chapter 10. This is what it says, verse 23, Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Okay, in other words, he's saying, don't let the corrosion build on your connection to the anchor. All right, hold fast, hang on. How are you going to do it? And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Listen, The Bible says don't grow weary in well-doing because in due time you're going to receive your reward. Has anybody here ever gotten weary in well-doing? Have you committed yourself and poured yourself out and then all of a sudden you're saying, well, what did it amount to? Worse than that, you got criticized for it. All right? Then you say, well, why bother? Well, I'm here to tell you. (laughs) I cannot tell you how many wonderful people, and I'm I'm going to give a shout-out to all my gray-haired friends. All right? I've got a head full of it, and I'm losing it even as we go. But I'm here to tell you, the seniors in our churches, I have found to be the most encouraging group of people on the face of the planet. Now, mind you, just because you're old doesn't make you an encourager. Some of you, I can't think of anybody right now. That's good news. But the truth of the matter is, The church I pastor is full of amazing people who pass out words of affirmation freely like fountains, and they should, and you should too. Don't miss a chance to say something good to somebody else. We're all leaky vessels. But I'm here to tell you something. Strength comes from the mind. Yes, you've got to have a body that's working, but we don't understand the body chemistry. But we do know this. When a person gets depressed, they want to do what? Lay in bed all day. I want to assure you, The inner strength that comes from Jesus and His Word and can flow through you can give somebody the strength to keep going. More good works. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together. That's our own, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Listen, this is 2024. I'm not a prophet. But I did watch Meet the Press or Face the Nation last Sunday, and they asked all of those pundits sitting around the table what they thought was coming in 2024. Well, depending on their background, but I'll tell you, the second person they asked was an older woman. She was very dour. She said, I'm concerned this will be a black swan year, a black swan event. The FedEx guy who dropped off some of the equipment for us this week had a nice visit with him. I don't know how it happened. God happens to do this, praise the Lord. But when we got towards the end of our, our visit, end of our working together, he said, yeah. Uh, he said, I believe there's a battle between good and evil going on in this world. I said, give me just a minute. I got a book for you. I walked inside the church. I got him a copy of Great Controversy. I stuck a business card inside of it. Told him I was the senior pastor. He could tune in on Saturdays. He might be working on Saturdays. I don't know. Listen, friends. We have an election coming this year. 
We have a country that seems to be tearing itself apart. I mean, how many secretaries of state and Supreme Courts can do more to drive a wedge into the political landscape that's being done right now? And that's just one arena. We could talk economics. We could talk race. We could talk environment. We could talk all kinds of things. The top is wobbling, and it will fall over. The Bible says the righteous can look to the future and not be afraid. I'm telling you how to do it. Number one, your commander-in-chief says he's going to strap on the armor and come down and carry the banner for the fight himself. That's Isaiah 59. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord himself will raise up a banner. But I'm here to tell you today, the church needs to be prepared to march. The final movements will be rapid because once the battle starts, everything goes fast. And this is the time to get ready. So turn off your TVs and quit watching so much YouTube. Let the Facebook be the Facebook or the metaverse be the metaverse, whatever it might be. But put some time and energy in getting to know the people that sit down the pew from you or are five rows in front or back of you. Stick around for an occasional fellowship meal and put a little effort in pouring out encouraging words on each other and let's keep doing more of it. And by the way, as much as I'm exhorting you to do this, this church is doing a good job of it, but we can all do better. And I'm telling you, absenting yourself from the spiritual meetings is wrong and bad and unhealthy. You set your schedules within certain parameters. I understand busy myself, but don't forsake the assembly together. I'm here to tell you, I know people who don't have family, but they do have a church. And I want to tell you, it makes a world of difference. And I'm here to tell you that lots of my family is a long ways away. But I've got this family right here. And it's better to have a friend nearby than a brother who lives a long ways away, says the proverbist. All right, I don't have much to go. I am going to say this. I'm going to end on the same thing here. I ended. Take your Bibles and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul will often say, I don't have any reason to write to you about this, and then he spends a chapter or two telling you what he said he didn't need to tell you. That's what I'm going to do right now, too. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. They gave a big offering. I was just reading about the Corinthians the other day out of Acts of the Apostles. They were suspicious. They thought Paul wanted their money, which is why he got with Aquila and Priscilla and made tents. So he actually had to be sustained by the churches in Macedonia. Go down to verse 7, but just as you abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and in knowledge and in all earnestness and in love as we inspire to you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I'm not speaking this as a command, but I'm proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love for me. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich." He'll go on to say, God loves a cheerful giver. What do I want to say to you about money? I want to quote the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for where your treasure is, there your what? Your heart will be also. The vitality that God is bringing back into this church is a function of laying up treasure in heaven and making the kingdom of heaven a priority on this earth. Now, in the last five or six weeks, God has blessed through this church and through the online church that we have, some members and some viewers, but all part of our family, God has allowed us to raise $800,000 to purchase this property next door. Can anybody say amen? amen? It's a miracle, just like the 150 unanimous people who voted anonymously to do it in a business meeting, which is a bigger miracle in my mind. But I want to remind you all of something. The tithe is not ours, and it's not given, it's just returned. And God is blessing everybody, but He wants to bless in a different way. And unfortunately, when we rob God, 
he does say that he deals with it. He calls it a curse. Now that part's easy. Simple. But let's go on to the other part. He says, you've robbed me in tithes and in what? Offerings. Now, I'm here to tell you, this church runs on the offerings. And I hope never again, I'll keep saying this, don't want to embarrass anybody, but I hope never again someone stands behind this plexiglass desk and says, we got to keep the lights and the heat on. It's embarrassing. My kids never worried about me keeping the lights and the heat on at home. They still don't. Neither does my wife. Keeping the lights and the heat on is just something people do. Our church is shot so low as a whole, as a denomination, especially the Western church. We've shot so low. And the preachers have been complicit by letting you live your convenient lives where nobody ever calls you to sacrifice or greater devotion financially. This is wrong. And as this church has decided it's not going to shoot so low, nothing but spiritual vitality and joy has grown into the ranks of those who have ever sacrificed with their socks or changed their systematic giving. But if you're not giving systematically to the functioning of this local organization, you're robbing yourself first, and you're robbing God. When I was a student at Andrews University, married, two years as an undergraduate, finishing making $400 a month. Now, that's 30-some years ago. But if you multiply it two or three times, it's still not much money. God blessed me. I knew from my in-laws that generous living was the Christian way. My wife and I determined that we would return 5% of our $400 in offerings. And every hour I worked on Sabbath at the dairy, I turned that money back into God too kind of keeps you from working on Sabbath. But the cows did need fed, and that was my job. I have never seen God's people or God's churches go backwards when they've been challenged to listen to Jesus and go forward and do more than they've done before. And I'm here to tell you, 2024 will not be less than 2023. God has moved fast, and He's saying to us, you go ahead and move a little bit faster. But he's promised to open the windows of heaven, and I've watched it happen over and over and over and over again. But there are people listening to me who have gotten themselves entrammeled with the wrong kind of debt. Yeah, you may need to borrow to get your house. Probably do. Most of us do. And you may need to borrow to get your car, but you may need to learn to just get by with the clunker junker. And you certainly don't have to rush out and get the latest version of silicon and battery. If your heart's in the earth, it's because your money's here. As soon as you realize you've got an anchor behind the veil who sweat great drops of blood, was abandoned by everybody, couldn't see through the darkness of eternal night, you'll start saying to yourself, it's time for some discipline that's going to get me to devotion. I will not be embarrassed to invite you into a business relationship with God where the only thing you end up with is a blessing. And by the way, last I checked, there's going to be a divine ignition point for everything that gets left behind. My kids bought me a... It's hard to buy your parents gifts. My family did a nice job. But one of the things I got, I've got a little wood stove in my house. One of the things I got was an electronic fire starter. You push the button, and the electricity arcs between two prongs. I'm waiting for somebody to be brave enough to stick their finger in there and see how strong of a shock they get. (laughs) But it won't be me. I want to tell you, when the power starts flowing and the fires start burning, everybody's glad but it does take some juice. We believe in systematic giving. Ancient Hebrews gave a quarter of their income. 10% was tithe. Then there was another 10%. And I'm inviting everybody to move a percent at least. And if you're already doing 
5% for the combined budget and a percent or two for Michigan Advance. And by the way, friends, like I said in a sermon a few weeks ago, Michigan Advance Partners, you care about refugees? Give to Michigan Advance Partners. And then there's the global budget. Yes, give specifically. That's fine. You can give specifically. But give systematically. And when God does you a big favor and you thought you needed a new engine in your car but all you needed was a new fuse, give a thank offering. When your furnace you think is going out and some good friend fixes it by reconnecting some wires or pipes or whatever, give a thank offering. God loves generous givers. That's what the Bible says. God loves cheerful givers. The lady who put in her last two mites, Jesus said, I don't care about what everybody else did, but I want everybody to know about what she did. And by the way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to leave you with this illustration. They issued over 400 permits to climb Mount Everest this last year. I want to talk to you about one. 478 permits this year. This story is from this year. This Nepali Sherpa guide, his name's Gelki, found a Malaysian climber freezing to death near the summit. That's this year. I want to show you what he looked like. He's in the death zone. He's at 27,200 feet. That means he's less than 2,000 feet from the top of the mountain. It gets down to 80 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. The man was sitting there. He was from Malaysia. He was shivering and shaking. The oxygen is so depleted here that between the temperatures and the inability to breathe, you will die if something doesn't happen. So here he is, a Malaysian man, whom for a while nobody knew who he was. We now know who he was. He's shivering and he's shaking, and along comes this 30-year-old Sherpa named Gelki. It took me five to six hours to get from 8,500 meters down to 7,900 meters. It took him a long time. Of course, he was in the death zone. When he finally got down there, he found another Sherpa that was willing to trade off with him. He came down 900 feet. He went down to Camp 4. Eventually, he went down to Camp 3. Here he is. He says, I was going toward the summit on the left with a Chinese client around 1230 to 1 o'clock at night. I met him in the balcony, which is in the death zone. Follow what he says. When I saw him, he was sitting on the balcony holding a rope. You come to church, friends, because there's some people sitting in the chair next to you, and you don't know how close they are to the death zone. They need a good word from you. And as he's finding this man, he says to his Chinese client, I'd like to save this man and not take you to the top. Now, I want you to imagine it's 1230 or 1 a.m. in the morning. You're a Chinese man, probably several Chinese men. You've paid big money to do what few people get to do, bragging rights to the top of the highest mountain on the face of the planet. But this Sherpa says to this man, and by the way, I don't know if this Chinese man was a Christian or not, but I want you to know something. He responded to the impulse of love, and he abode by the golden rule, do unto others as you'd like have done unto you. And this 30-year-old Sherpa talked this guy at 27,200 feet out of going to the top and letting him rescue this Malaysian man. And this is what he said, money can be earned any time. Left like that, he would have died. We've saved his life by quitting the summit. I'm here to tell you, friends, I'm about to show you the picture of the man whose life was saved, 50-some-year-old Malaysian man. But I'm here to tell you, by quitting some of the things that are going on right now in your personal life, you might create the awareness, the spiritual confidence, the spiritual boldness. You might generate more money. You might have more time to pray. By the things we've gone over here, what you leave off so you can put in what matters might generate the ability for somebody else to be saved. Here's a picture of him. I want you to look at him. Ravi Chandran. I won't say his last name. You can't see it well because of our screen, but he's talking with a colonel in the Malaysian army And there's a tear flowing out of his eye right here. I want to tell you, friends, that Sherpa who brought him down from the death zone got him down to 23,000 feet where a helicopter got him off the mountain, took him to a hospital in Kathmandu. Two of his friends in the same group died. One was found frozen to death and one is lost on Everest. Well, what does that spell? I'm here to tell you, friends, 
There are people on this planet right now who need to run into you. And you need to take them out of the death zone through the power of the Holy Spirit and the vibrancy of a living Christ in your heart. Knowing that behind the veil, your anchor is anchored and you'll do nothing for Jesus where you won't be repaid and rewarded, starting with the inside, the intrinsic reward, and when necessary, going to the out. Yes, Ravi Chandran is alive today in Malaysia because a 30-year-old Sherpa said, I could make more money taking you to the top. And I don't know what he got. I don't know how the Chinese guy related to him. But I'm going to tell you this. He made the right decision. And today is a day of decision making. It's a day for all of us to stop and say, there's a year in the books. God gave me life and health and vitality. And there's a year that might get to get lived, but I get to live it one day at a time. I want to live it for Christ. I want the routine fundamentals in my life. I want to hear him speaking. I want to find victory in Christ. I want my church to come alive. I want to be alive, and I want to see Jesus. This morning, friends, I'm asking you, what decisions are you willing to make for God? He's speaking. You listen. It's between you and Him. But I'm appealing to you. Don't ignore Him. And if something was amplified today in this divine worship hour, take it as a sign from God. If you're really confused, find a godly person and just bounce your idea off them to see if you're still balanced or not. But this is the day. It's the last Sabbath. This is December 30. And tomorrow will be the last day of the year. May God help us to go to higher ground. May we cut the ties that bind us to this earth, protect the ties that bind us to our hope, which is inside the veil, and may we go forward to the finish, trusting in Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn.